because you're now setting yourself up to build a foundation for your future self. And I think that's what people really need to think about and really get real about, you know, where do you want to go? Do you have the resources to get there? If you don't, cool. You only have three things, time, skill, or money. If you have a lot of time, use it to get skill. Once you get the skill, trade it for money. Once you have enough money, then you can buy back your time. Welcome to the Tom Story Show with Steve Karish and Tom Story, where we discuss everything real estate or whatever else is on our minds. Do I, did I bring my sexy voice today here, Tom? I feel like a little bit. Well, we'll let the viewers decide. We've already hit record. Tom. We'll let them, oh, dude. Let oh, them tell us in the, in the <laughs> comment section. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Tom Story Show. I hope you're having a wonderful day and happy St. Patrick's Day. Steve, how much green beer will you consume today? I don't drink beer anymore. Um, I just ran upstairs to try and find our St. Patrick's Day stuff because I am uh, Irish by marriage and uh, I couldn't find any, so I apologize. I will well, be drinking them. Hopefully everyone's enjoying your green beer today. I appreciate you being here. Thank you for watching the show. If you're watching us on YouTube and you're coming back every single week and you have not already, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Also throw this video a like. If you're listening on the audio platforms, I hope you're having a wonderful day wherever you are driving. Steve? And agents, tell other people in your office about us because oh, yeah. that seems to be one of the ways we are growing, at least on the audio side. The audio side's blowing up YouTube lately, yeah, but the audio side's been blowing up. So uh, if you know a lonely agent that needs to hear what's going on in the market and, uh, you know, just let them, let them know. I, uh, we are on episode 99 today. Can you believe the that? Wayne Gretzky of episodes. The Wayne one. Gretzky of episodes. I cannot believe we've almost made it to 100, which is crazy. And how do we celebrate? A momentous day like this, well, we have on a guest who has been on our list to come on this show for a long, long time. Justin Conico has joined the show from Prime Real Estate Brokerage. He works the greater London area. Justin's got the Prime People podcast as well. But more than anything else, he's just a good guy. We like him. We're excited for him to be here. What's going on, man? Just hanging out in southwestern Ontario. It is sunny. Apparently, spring is early this year and mm -hmm. the market rip. So happy to chat with two of the best in the business. So are you really seeing the market picking up like we're seeing as well? Is it happening everywhere? And is it because because we're not really finding it yet for condos It's getting a little bit better, but like houses are are moving. They're moving. Yeah. So, you know, what's interesting about what we do is I call it focus diversification. So where you are in the commercial space, um, mm. we're in residential new construction and the investment space, technically. Um, the residential resale market definitely started picking up, but it did last year too, right? So that January to May run, I think we were all expecting that. The question is, does it continue if they drop rates? And that's something that we're watching. We don't necessarily think it's gonna continue to rip and buy now or you know, prices are never gonna go down. But what I was actually really shocked about is on the new development side. Um, mm -hmm. I was talking with recently and I was talking about how all of a sudden a site that we had that we had been grinding on for call it, we sold six units in the last week. We only have eight left and we're launching two new sites. And it's completely changed how we're looking at our pre-launch sequence. And we have five other development sites in the chamber that we are like reorganizing all of our timelines based on the inquiries, the sentiment we're seeing in the actual phone calls that we're making and, and showings and offer engagement and interaction. And then also, if you saw Phil Soper's recent post, he said, you know, if you look at the actual showing activity, it's up 25%. Now, will that continue? Nobody knows. But I think what surprised me more was the sentiment towards new construction in our market anyways um, that I've seen over the last couple of weeks. And when you talk about new construction, your market, that is freehold homes. It's like homes you're building, right? Like not condos or is it condos too? It's a mix. So it's not high rises. So most people think pre-construction, they're like right. giant towers that I'm buying off paper and they're going to build in three to five years. In our market, Landings, Port Stanley is a really good case study. Um, Port Stanley, Ontario is about 25 minutes from London. And we did semi-detached bungalows. And when we launched, they were like 350. Um, those are now worth, call it 550 to 650. There's a 19 detached homes that we sold on that site. And those would have ranged at the peak from like 900 to one, two, those are those probably with the drop came down to about 800, so still a million. And now that site that I was just referencing are attached condominium. Hmm. There's a pool, they're really nice product and they're selling in the mid sixes, almost all the way up to the sevens. So price point wise, they're actually surprising. And how do you compare that to you're saying you were grinding on these? I'm, I'm guessing that was like end of last year trying to figure out how the heck you're going to sell these. And then we switched to 2024 and now you're a little bit surprised by the traction. Um, 
is it are they just like selling fa just just overall coming in like they're actually selling like and who's who's buying it is it just more investors grabbing up all the units from yeah. everybody else or is this actually people that are going to live there no so he, the investment market i think has dried up for two reasons one we could talk about you know db issues and people holding their landlords hostage and there's a fear in the investment space right now i um, mean i don't think investors have seen the ear markers of sales to really jump in and just buy them and rent and just hang on to them i think that comes back in the fall if this continues landings port stanley is a demographic of downsizers so older people are looking for a great community to live in and it's actually turned into this really cool micro community and they're all becoming friends they're pumped for the pool to launch and they're even if they don't have friends they buy into a community of like-minded people close to the beach so i i almost think you're gonna see niche developments do very well that have personality and a target audience um, i think where you're gonna see new developments struggle is when it's just hey i'm gonna drop 60 houses in this area and they're all ubiquitous and they don't speak to anybody um, right. i think those will probably struggle over the next year. It's interesting too, because when you talk about it, it's like, you know, maybe people downsizing that are buying these. Well, the people that are downsizing are probably, if I had to guess, coming from homes that are paid off with no mortgages and they can just, you know, drop 600 grand to buy this condo because they've sold their house and they're sitting on a ton of equity um, yeah. where, you know, it's a lot harder. And even if you look at our market right now, all of our markets, it's like freehold properties are the ones that are making the headlines in terms of what is actually doing well. And when I look at that, it's like, okay, well, who's buying this? Is it a first time home buyer buying this house for, for their first property? In Toronto, it's not. The people that are moving up had a ton of equity coming from something else. So even though the rates are significantly higher, it's like they can still make it work because they have this big down payment. It's those people coming in for the first time, those renters coming into home ownership that I feel like are still kind of struggling. Steve, what are you seeing in your market with that? Is it kind of similar? I mean, we're kind of good all over the board. We're not really in a bad spot anywhere. We're not in a good spot anywhere. We're definitely not seeing, like, if anything, we're reversed from you. Mm -hmm. Right. If anything, our our condos and our townhouses are doing well. Uh, I, I'm still absolutely amazed by the people calling about presales. I'm just I'm because you know me with like, presales. I'm like, don't touch them. Like they're they're five six years out. They are high rises here for the most part. Some are low rises. Sure. Um, I'm like, just don't touch. Like if you want to become an investor, get into this. Mm -hmm. And there's just there's just an appetite for them that I just cannot Steve, understand. When you can buy something right now and put a ten, I in. I've been well, we've both been actively talking out against specific new construction options in our market for the past four years. I'd say like there's a tra you can go find it. Like we have receipts online. Either we we put out videos of it, right? I think actually if we're positive the pre-construction Steve people will stop buying then. I think because we're negative Maybe. they're Maybe. they're just it just reverse. Um I don't know like on on the pre-con side Justin for you is like is this is there a little bit for developers too because they're not going to build unless they can make a profit on this. So are yeah. you seeing developers getting excited about what the future looks like cuz I mean 2023 is pretty grim for everybody. So London's probably like five years behind everybody else, right? If you just look at the natural progression of the 401, you look at the GTA, then you look at Oakville, and then you go down to even Kitchener, Hamilton. London is now becoming Kitchener. So I would say like right when the bubble popped, London was hyped about high rises, pre-sales, towers, projects were starting to make sense. We were over $300 a square foot. So the developer could say, make some money on the sales side of things, but it all ground to a halt. And how much supply came offline? I'd probably say at least 40% of the projects were just like, okay, let's shelf this until the market comes back. The economics don't make sense and people aren't buying off the paper. I do think now they're looking at the next five years and realizing like, okay, yeah, it, it may take 12 months for us to ramp back up, but there's clearly a runway that we can see happening. And I do feel like the conversations, I was just at the commercial building awards, the conversations I had in that room is they're looking for land. They're dialing in their team. They've gotten their expenses down. Some of them fired 18% of their staff that weren't showing up at the office and not even working and they've gotten lean and they're ready for the market. And I do think that the sentiment in our market anyways, and this is I'm totally biased because it's my market, um, but with Volkswagen building the largest EV plant in North America with Amazon setting up shop with the amount of industrial infrastructure coming down the highway, people selling their homes and coming here with their bags of money saying, where am I going to live for the next 20 years? I can work from home, go into the GTA two or three days a week if I have to, but then I could be at the beaches on the weekend. 
Like, I think the developers are recognizing that and now looking for projects like Landings, Port Stanley and launching them in even not primary markets like London, I think, is going to have to compete with St. Thomas in a huge way because they rolled out the red carpet for all of that industrial investment and capital injection. And now all the Turkish markets, sorry, my camera keeps switching. No, it's all good. All good. Um, all the tertiary markets are doing the same thing. And you're starting to see all of these markets absolutely looking to roll out the red carpet for developers that, that really want to pop off. And I think it's coming, but I still think we're a little ways away here. Okay, you said one thing uh, as you're starting that that conversation, and I saw Steve's eyes kind of go, hmm? And I just wanted clarity on this. When you, $300 a square foot, is that what the building cost is, or is that what the selling cost is for this new construction? So, I mean, when everything started, and go back, when I'm talking $300 a square foot, I'm talking like 2018, 2019. So, where is it at I'm today? Not, your, your construction costs are going to be significantly... More but that was construction that. costs, not selling costs. Yeah. That three, okay. Yeah, your four, like your average dollar per square foot sale price for residential condos is going to be around your four fifty a square foot, right? Okay. Four four fifty to four forty seven a square foot, which is actually holding pretty decent. So when we're running stats, people are advertising stuff at six hundred to seven hundred a square foot, but it's always selling closer to that mark. Could be, I mean, that's still sixty percent cheaper than what's launching yeah. in the city of Toronto. That's exactly why people are moving here, right? Crazy, because okay, so. I'm trying to wrap my head around this. So I understand the cost of land. So in my market and Steve's market, the cost of the land for the developer is very expensive, right? And front foot, just for context. Sorry? What is it a front foot approximately? Uh, honestly, I don't know. I'm not involved in this okay. world, but I, I, you see the sale prices and it's like millions and millions and millions of dollars to buy sure. these plots of lands from these big developers. So that I understand that that goes into the total cost. You know, we, we've talked about it a million times on the show, how the government just keeps scraping away as much as they can from the developers to make it tough to build and make affordable housing. But is it like the developers that are in your market, Greater London, are they just cheaper to build just because it's London? Are they like the people in Toronto just like, it's Toronto, so this is our cost here? Are you getting that 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 extra tax put on it, not an actual tax, but the developer is just going like, because I get the land cost, but still you break everything else down. That's so much cheaper. Land and taxes are going to be your largest cost, right? So taxes will be 33, 34%. We only, we don't have the same taxes you guys have. Okay. Today. That's a big part of it. Right. Um, if you look at St. Thomas versus London, dev charges are different. London and used to waive dev charges on certain projects. Now they try to take it off every single project. And then St. Thomas will waive it in many instances because their downtown took an absolute beating when Ford shut down, like they lost all their manufacturing. It was rough and nobody wanted to live there. And it was 25% cheaper than London. Now, I would argue it's on par if not some people are moving there and wanting to be there because of what's happening from an investment perspective. But here's here's the answer to your question. So if I'm somebody buying land and I'm in London right now, I'm buying it and I asked front foot for a reason, I'm buying at like 8,000 a front foot. If I'm buying in a secondary market, I'm paying 2,500, 3,000 a front foot. Mm. If I'm in Toronto, Hamilton, GTA, I've heard numbers, crazy numbers, up to 16,000 a front foot, almost double the cost of the land. So if I'm now selling product, my cost of build is going to be hundreds of dollars more. And I think that's where the biggest difference is, is people wanting to be in an area because they know, hey, I'll pay a premium because I know I could sell it for more. That's what led to everything running up to 2022. We saw a huge balancing out of that. Everybody left to move to the country for two years for COVID because they didn't want to be in the city. They realize they're not country folk and they sold their places and now they're back in the city and the city's thriving. I think it's going to be very interesting to watch over the next two years, a great balancing of the markets and development. I think cities like Toronto and London are going to have to realize they have to roll out the red carpet and become more efficient as a city if they're going to want to incentivize development and bring product to market because it, it's very difficult to make the economics make sense. Um, and I think they're going to realize that over the next year with the amount of new development projects that just haven't been hitting the shelves, right? When we had Tim Hudak on the show, he was talking about that, right? Like you have to give, there has to be a carrot in the stick situation for developers. You have to give them an incentive to actually do this. Otherwise, you know, they'll still launch, but the prices are just going to be crazy if you're going to continue to tax them. So I actually... Not that long ago, I drove right past London. I went to Leamington, Ontario. Shout out Amazing. Cody! Shout out Cody Kraus. When I spoke to his Century Twenty One up there, um, and I was having a conversation with Cody. It was really interesting because we were talking about like you know we're all running into it right now where we're meeting with potential sellers. 
that depending on when they bought their property, they might be taking a loss, especially mm -hmm. after paying land transfer tax and, and real estate fees and everything else. And it was, it was an interesting conversation. So he said he had just sold the property for somebody and on paper, they lost about $80,000 mm -hmm. from buying it in the peak and having to sell it now. And I was like, well, that must have been a tough conversation. He's like, well, actually, they were like some of the most realistic people I've ever talked to. The, the property they sold before buying that one, they sold for more money than they ever thought was possible and made this massive chunk of money. So the 80 grand loss here is just put into there and overall they're still up like 300 or something. Now, this isn't me trying to be real y and saying like, well, it's sure. not a loss if you if you got such a gain sure on the last is. one. Um, sure is. I don't think it is. It's just, that's a conversation I haven't heard brought up that often. It's like the people no, that I think- we're experiencing that too. So we yeah. are seeing, so for instance, I'm just in my head, I have a guy that moved at the peak of the market and uh, sold a detached home downsized and went to a townhouse. I'm doing an evaluation on that. Like this was Feb 22. Right. And I'm doing an evaluation on that property and I'm like, oh, I don't know, down six figures, down maybe, maybe 150. And so now we're like, it's a tough conversation to have. Hey, I know you paid X for this, but you know, if you really want to sell, you're going to be a hundred grand less than that, maybe more. And then the expenses are going to come off the top. But I did the realtor thing that Tom just did <laughs> an evaluation on his detached home that he sold at the peak of which is down at least 250, if not 400 now. So it's a funny thing that we do. We all lock in. Now, if you're a first time buyer, this is bad. If you've been in the market a very long time, you've got this thing where you've locked in this new price at a certain date and this is where I'm losing money and you discount the previous 45 years that they owned that detached home, right? So it's a tough conversation to have, but that is what's driving the market. That's stored equity. Everybody, mm -hmm. I'm so sick of people saying income in relation to house prices. It doesn't have as big a factor specifically not in but, Vancouver, or but Toronto, you can understand like, why they're saying that, though, right? Like when you look at the charts, it is pretty clear the way house prices have gone versus income. It's it's crazy. Like you understand the that argument, right? It is crazy, but it doesn't mean it has to be part of the calculation. All that stored equity from all those people that have been paying for so long, and then the new people that you're shoveling in, it's just causing that equity to drive the market. Like people don't understand how much people have in equity in their homes. They just have no idea because they're on the bottom of the rung. They have no equity and they're having trouble getting in. So they don't understand how much money is already in the system. This episode is brought to you by Realty Ninja. Real estate agents, listen up. Realty Ninja has created over 9,000 Canadian real estate websites and they are no joke. I've been using Realty Ninja in my business since they were a small little startup in North Vancouver. Tiny, dusty little office with old leather couch and all. But look at the ninjas now. Realty Ninja is the go-to platform for real estate agents in Canada. Websites are no longer a nice to have. They are a must. Your clients expect you to feature their listings in the best light possible. They expect you to go with Realty Ninja. The backbone of my real estate business is my website. I wouldn't pick any other company to host my website other than Realty Ninja. Don't believe me? Go to my website. Check it out right now. Go to krproperties.ca and you will see that it's powered by Realty Ninja and has been for over a decade. They have all of the features I need to grow my business year after year, including lead capture, mobile-friendly design, built-in SEO, and so much more. The best part of Realty Ninja is it's totally free to sign up, no credit card is required, and you only pay when you are ready to launch your new Realty Ninja website. And no, that's not it. Sign up today at realtyninja.com slash Tom, and you will receive 20%, yes, 20% off of your entire first year when using Realty Ninja to host your real estate website. Their templates are super easy to work with yourself, or you can have the ninjas design something for you like I did. Not only is Realty Ninja the best product on the market, but it's also affordable. Listeners of this show know that I am as cheap as they come, and I've been using Realty Ninja for well over a decade now. Start your free trial today, and when you launch, save 20% using our link in the description below. And let Realty Ninja help you take your real estate business to the next level. 
And now, back to the podcast. Does that make sense? Like, that's the reality of, no, I get it, the of, reality of where we're at. So this, like, this is a really long rant, I'm sorry. Doesn't that, though, get you back to, did my client that I was speaking to just lose 150 grand? Well, that goes back to the casino analogy, right? If you walk into the casino with 100 bucks, you get it up to $300 right away, and then you leave with $240. You've right been in the casino for 45 years. <laughs> <laughs> Did you make money? Did you lose money? Well, it depends on how you're looking at the numbers. And that's, I love, we, I think us three, we all love numbers. We try to make sense of what's going on with it. But the reality is too, we can tell, and not just us, but anybody, you can tell whatever side of the story you want to sure. tell by taking certain data points on the numbers and cherry picking certain things. And so I don't know, like, Justin, are you seeing that? Or are you guys helping people sell properties that are, you know, like if they bought in February 22, they've lost a good chunk of money. Is it happening? What are they doing? Yeah, I mean, it's it's exactly how you guys broke it down. And I do try and be very conscious not to be realtory when I'm having these conversations and saying, you know, buy or sell is never, never a bad thing. You know, if you buy, don't worry. What you're buying has dropped in price. So even if you lost, it balances out. But the truth of the matter is, is it truly does. And I, I do look at, like myself when I purchase or sell, you know, you have, you have a cost to opportunity. So when we sold a house that, you know, we'd purchased for $330,000 and sold it for four ninety, we're like, Oh my gosh, we made so much money. And then the market ripped six months after that, like we could have sold for six fifty. But at the same time, we got a lot for pennies on the dollar because the market wasn't great when we bought it and then managed to lock in a builder and start building a house at much lower costs. The construction costs could have gone up. And if I look at the net effective of my portfolio, to your point, Todd, uh, Tom, I think that's what people need to do. And you know, if you haven't bought or you haven't sold, you haven't really lost money. So if you're looking at February 22, 22 prices and you're looking at today and you're like, oh no, I lost. $500,000 I could have sold at the peak. Well, you would have bought at the peak and you likely would have spent significantly more than now you'd be having the opposite conversation of, oh no, I bought at the peak and look at where I'm at now, right? So when we're advising clients, what we try to do is have a macro conversation around the yeah. marketplace, really try to find out what their objective is and try and get super dialed in on how fiscally conservative are they being? Because I think one of the problems we're seeing is a lack of financial education in people. They don't know how to save money. They don't know what they can really afford. They don't work with mortgage brokers or professionals that are giving them good advice. The mortgage brokers and the real estate agents that are just have commission breath are just yeah. pushing them into that they shouldn't be in, right? And that's where I've seen the problems happen and they buy jet skis and go on vacations and all the things they shouldn't be doing and then now you're going to be paying for it. And here's how I really look at it from a business perspective. When we look at our numbers, I go back to 2019. Even 2020 to 2022, I wasn't be like, all right, look at what we crushed in 2022. Now let's pull set for 2023. Like I run off my 2019 numbers. So take a 10 year span of your mm. personal snapshot and do the exact same thing. And I think you know, you, you'll find you're much more balanced than your emotions may feel. Steve, are you finding this with clients? Like are people being good with money now because they have to, because they have no choice? Because all the all the money they would have spent on dinners or God forbid a fifteen thousand dollar vacation to Disney, all this money they would have spent, they're now saying, Well, I still have to spend it somewhere, but instead of going out here, it's just going into my mortgage every month. Like are they finding is it is it working for them? It seems to be working because I'm not getting the panic. Yeah. I'm not getting the panic at all. Are you are you getting the panic? Like, are you getting those? I, I'm hearing of people saying, okay, I got a, you know, I've got clients that have to get out. I don't know why I don't have them. I have a few. It's not, it's not the bulk of our business, but we've had a few conversations. Justin, by the way, you're a little blurry, but you're totally still here. So it's fine. I yeah, yeah. don't. Yeah. I'm trying to fix my camera. Call. I have no idea what's happening here, We're but you guys keep jamming. I, I can speak to the panic. Um, you know, we've dealt with some really tough situations, problems that other agents put their clients in that there was one for the guy who was into it for 1.8 million had two second mortgages on the place. It was worth one, one five. And we had to get super creative. I had to call the, the lender, the private lender and first negotiate on his behalf and be like, dude, you're not, you're not going to see your money. 
it's going to probably sell for 900 to a million if you don't list it and go through the sales process a certain way. Probably worth 1-1. One, one. Um, but I think if you do it this way, you can achieve 1-1-5. One, one, and long story short, we, we spent hours building bridges with these people that literally could have destroyed this guy's entire life. And it took us a long time, but we figured out a creative solution for a very painful problem. And it came down to the fact that he overextended himself thinking the market would never turn. Back to what I said earlier, yeah, right? And but that was a private lender. So a private lender lent too much on the property. Two private lenders lent too much on the property, mm -hmm. essentially. Yes. Was Maybe I just don't have these crazy people that go private. Yeah, yeah, it's tricky. And we get calls from banks all the time. And it's funny, so I even noticed the A lenders were calling us on files and they're like, we don't want to take this property back. Like we're going to foreclose on it on X date go find a solution for this. And we do not want to trigger the foreclosure because we also know the market sucks and we aren't in the real oh. estate sales business. So I've seen it on both sides, both private and a lenders as well. I've been thinking about, so what if I'm just going to play worst case scenario here, here for a little second, because it's fun to talk about these things. Sometimes what if you were, Oh, you only bought and you were you just wanted to get into the market and you just timed it bad and it wasn't your fault and you bought in those three months at the beginning of 2022. And you bought because you had FOMO, you had fear that if I don't buy now, this thing's just gone. I'm never gonna get into home ownership. And, and whether it was because it was bad advice online or just because your family said it's time to get in the market, like some people are just unlucky, right? Those people, let's, let's say they bought that property and they didn't have a quality lending uh, background on what their numbers were. So they had to go not just a B lender, but maybe even close on on a private lender. So sure. it's usually a shorter term. So it's one or two years. And let's say that term's coming up now ish or soon. They don't want to stay with that private lender. They have to go back. They're going to try to get back into the A lending space, but they're going to have to have their property reappraised. And it might not even appraise at what they paid for it in 2022. So that's the people I think that like, you know, there's a certain percentage of, of buyers out there that fall in that category and it's going to be really, really tough. Um, I'm not really sure what they're going to do. They're going to have to sell, but if they sell, they're going to take a loss and probably be underwater. So they're selling, you're saying at on only a cup after a couple of years and they've gone to a private lender. No, no. What I'm saying is when they first bought the property, they closed on it with private money, which they, which they yeah. shouldn't have. Um, but I, I've heard one example of this, right? Uh, that's why I'm bringing this up. It's not someone I know well. It was like through this person and this person. Yeah. Now the the two year term on the private money's up. They've figured out all their their finances. They want to take it to an A lender, but the A lender is going to reappraise the property and look at what you paid in the peak of the market. Mm -hmm. And if they're coming in at eighty percent of what you paid, then you either have to find more cash just to move it, or you might have to sell. But if you sell, you're taking this massive loss. Justin, can you solve this for I, me? I Put my hand up like I'm a, in school. <laughs> yeah, um, I think if you're in a bad relationship, you're not going to get anywhere by pretending you're not in a bad relationship, right? I think mm -hmm. my answer to that question is maybe you shouldn't be going back to the A lender and, and you should probably sell that house and buy something that you can afford. Right. I think, unfortunately, it, I'm not trying to be callous by saying that. I'm just being very direct that I am seeing that pattern as well, too, of you know people willing to go back to work people willing to realize how much money they're spending on reoccurring things they signed up for that are just literally draining their bank accounts and i think our house is our biggest asset and i think you have to be able to sit down especially as a professional with somebody and have an honest conversation with them and be like is it really the right move for you to go reappraise this for less money take another hit on this property or is selling this house and getting into another property that is the right fit for you and maybe a market that's not a primary market but an yeah. emerging market going to add a quarter million to your balance sheet down the road because if you sell that house for a million dollars you buy one for six or seven hundred in an emerging market and in the next five to ten years that market becomes a primary market all of a sudden your entire life changes but i think back to the relationship analogy sometimes people like to keep up appearances and are not willing to really look at how healthy are they financially right I think, and there's people that will hold on as long as possible because that ego hit to go, mm -hmm. okay, I have this, I, everything I've done, I worked for to get here yep. because of circumstances that potentially were outside my control. Like they might not made the best, you know, uh, guesses on what was going to happen, but they got in 
and then oh, I have to sell this and take a loss and then move somewhere I don't even want. Like that's just as a human being, you never want to feel like you're going backwards or down the ladder in life. But ego's getting worse. Yeah, I think right people there's less willingness to do that now than ever before that's what i'm saying yeah because like yeah. for instance my parents were both raised on the west side of vancouver if they would have bought real estate instead of in 1977 buying real estate in surrey bought it on the west side of vancouver and stayed there we'd be talking like a tear down six million dollars or whatever right like that's what would have been but they didn't so they did the move out and in a lot of my career people would swallow their pride and say you know what i got that hour-long commute it's going to happen. So we did have a ton of people that would move from Surrey to Abbotsford, from Abbotsford to Chilliwack. They would do that move. I'm not seeing it right now. I'm not seeing many people willing to put another hour in their day or more in order to put a little bit more money in their pocket. And you think it should be easier now because a lot more people are working from home, but that seems to be going away as well. Yeah, you, you were seeing a return to, I think, normalcy of like, we, we got to actually work hard and produce as a society, in my opinion, right? I think even for myself, right? Like I, with the team and the company that I run and everything else, a lot of people in my position, they would never hold an open house. They wouldn't pick up the phone and do a lot of the work that I do. And the reason I do it is for, for two is one, just to have my ear to the ground and actually understand the sentiment that I'm seeing with consumers. But two, to realize that, you know, despite all that we are blessed with, I have to keep working to maintain it. And I, I want to make sure I never get too high on my britches. I never live beyond my means because I've seen so many second generation, third generation families that you thought would never go anywhere and they're broke. And it's typically because the kid work ethic, they never exist. They never had any re resistance. They never went through any hard times. To me, I actually think what we've seen in the last few years is the best opportunity to set us up for innovation and growth over the next 10 or 20 years than my entire lifetime I've seen. But I think the key is finding a community of people that makes it feel okay to have these conversations and say like, you know, nobody's expecting you to drive that car. Nobody cares that you're on that vacation. Nobody cares that you posted that on Instagram other than you, because you're looking at other people doing that, thinking that that's your barometer of success. What you said earlier about willing to drive to a market that's maybe 45 minutes or an hour away. Like, Man, when I moved to London, I lived with seven people in a hallway until I didn't have to. I worked really hard. One guy moved out, then I took his room. Then I lived with five people. Then I lived with three people. Then I lived with two people. Then I lived with one person. Then got into a housing and then flipped that house for a bigger house. And then and then took me probably a decade. Um, and you know, I think that is okay for a lot of people to realize that you're not going backwards. Like mm -hmm. you recognizing that you're not in a financial position to own a $1.2 million house and have an automotive lease for a car that you can't afford and that you got to pull back on some of the expenses that are nice to have but not needs is actually you moving forward because you're now setting yourself up to build a foundation for your future self. And I think that's what people really need to think about and really get real about you know where do you want to go do you have the resources to get there? If you don't, cool. You only have three things, time, skill, or money. If you have a lot of time, use it to get skill. Once you get the skill, trade it for money. Once you have enough money, then you can buy back your time. Because getting out of that uh, situation or that bad relationship, right? Um, even though you could feel, maybe it's just a mindset shift. You could feel that that is going backwards. Uh, it's actually maybe actually going forwards because financially you're putting yourself in a better position. You're not stressed out all the time. Yep. Um, even for me, like, listen, some of my best friends uh, that we go out and have beers and whatever and catch up, we don't get into the nitty gritty of what our mortgage payments are or how much money we have. You don't talk about those things. Like, I think part of the people or the reason why people maybe even like this show or show up and listen to us is like, we're talking about things that aren't happening unless it's like maybe within family. So no one's openly talking about what type of terrible situation they're in other than it's if it's to their banker or their real estate agent or their mortgage broker. Like we're hearing these stories, mm -hmm. but uh, they're not telling the people closest to them probably just because they don't want to be looked down on. Like, oh, we, you, oh, you're in that situation. And and they would you know, think that maybe that would change their relationship with the people closest to them. Did you think there's something in that? Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I mean, to myself, like, I don't want, want to let my wife or daughter down ever. But, but the less I communicate with them, the less we're actually growing as a couple, right? One of my mentors taught me that. I was like, what's your secret to success with everything you do? 
And he's like, oh, I just tell my wife I don't take any appointments after six. She can cancel them if there's something important going on. And then also I actually just tell her what's going on two weeks ahead. Hey, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. And they're in sync where I think people are out of sync on the financial side of things is they're scared to look at their bank account. They're scared to look at their mortgage payments. They're stressed about the future. Like ask yourself this question. If you lost your job today, how long would you be able to last before you lost your house and everything else? Because that can happen, right? Employers will cut employees like that. It's a scary thing to ask yourself, but fear only really works if you let fear make the decisions for you or you hide from it. If you just look fear in the face and you recognize it for what it is, you'll notice the most successful people usually are fearful as well, but they don't act because of fear or hide from it, they usually act in spite of it and say, oh crap, I need to do something about this. What's the plan? And actually do something about it. And maybe the plan is call a financial advisor or a mortgage broker and just saying like, give me a health checkup, where am I at, right? I uh, And don't be like me and don't let a 100 year global pandemic happen for you to actually sit down and run the numbers. Because I remember like when going back to March 2020, we didn't know if we'd be able to work. I sat down and put all my numbers on a piece of paper and figured out how long can I survive if I, if I can't work. And it was a very interesting thing. It's scared. Even right now, I'm doing some tax planning stuff, some insurance stuff, and I'm filling out all these forms and, and, and putting in all these numbers. And like I... It's cringy for me to even think like I don't feel good until it's done. And then when it's done, I look at it and go like, okay, you know what? I I'm I'm gonna be okay, but just not knowing where you stand financially is such a scary thing. What yeah. most people don't know about Tom is he's much more by the seat of his pants than everybody likes. <laughs> he's very nonchalant about a lot of this type of stuff. Yeah. And I think that's because he's so well business minded that sure. he's like yeah there's just more income obviously it's coming right so that's kind of like a like, like that's a that's a reality uh, i am the guy that opens my bank account every single day and said if there's not another penny how long do i have that's me sure that's every single morning i check my stocks i check both bank accounts my company bank account plus my bank account and then i asked tom about something and he's like yeah no, no. Let me just uh, be clear here. Okay. My business life is so structured and I take it so seriously that when I get home or when I go on vacation and when my family's with Steve's family, I'm pretty loosey goosey because I'm so like, if I lived my personal life, the way I lived my business life, I would not be very fun at all. For tenant, landlord, or homeowner insurance policies, go to squareone.ca slash the Tom story show. Use the link in the description. Save $20 when you start your free quote right now. So I try to just be like, okay, let, we'll just, just figure this stuff out. But I'm financially uh, fine, Steve. I appreciate your support. This, but so I, I know you're financially fine. I, I'm just saying it's not by it's you're financially fine because it's not because like you get into the. You know why I'm financially fine? Plan. You want you want the answer why? Because I invested in real estate in 2015 and bought a bunch of properties. And even though the market's gone down, it's put myself in a very very good financial position because of real estate. But but a lot of people are going to say, well, yeah, Tom, that's easy for you to say. If I start investing now, the next 10 years aren't going to be like the last 10 years. And I'd probably agree with them. Real estate's my retirement plan, not selling it. It's owning it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, so I'll, I'll actually jump in and say I'm probably more on the other end of the spectrum than you, Steve, from the standpoint that I'll run through a brick wall. I could lose it all tomorrow. And I know that I would go sling garbage. I, I ran Joe Cools in London for a decade. So I used to take garbage sopping wet through Joe Cools while everybody was partying because I, I, I'll work, right? Like at the end of the day, I do know that I will find a way to make it work. My wife is actually the one who's the numbers girl, Ivy grad, super sharp. She's the broker of record, owns Prime, right? And yeah. I also I say that for a reason, because I'm talking in depth about getting financially literate, getting a snapshot, like being real about life. But if you don't have that capability in you, partner with somebody that does. Find good people that you can trust. I married her, but there's other people that yeah. you can partner with, whether from a business perspective or advisors, that can be that crutch for you. The one caveat is be very careful about who you choose to partner with and what their end game is too, because there's a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing in this business. Um, so I just wanted to put that giant asterisk to that statement. So all three of us have better halves 
that's a very obvious statement, right? We have better people than us that we're in relationships with that help us move our lives along. And I think having that stable at home personal relationship, honestly, I can, I, I've been with, you know, my wife for 10 years, I've been in real estate for 10 years. She's seen the entire journey. She's seen everything, right? Yeah. And I don't know, and I really do mean this, and I don't know if she's going to listen to this episode, but like, I don't think I'd be where I was today if I didn't have structure at home. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like it would, I don't know. Like I look at some people that I know that are, you know, still doing the single life and there's nothing wrong with that, right? You get to live this life once, you do whatever makes you happy. But the people that I know that are succeeding at the highest level typically have some level of structure in their personal life. Um, so it's that part key. that you pick house, is so important. Yeah. In, in my house, uh, I it's it's called the the better one third, just based on our sizes. But um <laughs> really it's it, it is true, right? Like that is such a foundation and everybody that is success. Like think about this. Let's tie this back to real estate for a second. If you do have that, that breakup, think about the division right there of all the assets that you've worked together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's a massive reset for so many people that find themselves in a bad situation. Like I can't imagine anything better than the business partner that I have in life. And then I can't imagine if that went sour, anything worse. It's almost impossible to think that that could be because, I mean, if you're Tom, you own properties with other people. If that relationship goes south, you don't have to go to bed with them tonight. Right. You know I, mean? I mean, you could, maybe that would make the relationship get better, but <laughs> I'm just saying like, you don't have to really worry about that. Right. So it is such, I, I mean, I think it sounds like we're all kind of in a very similar situation there tom you don't really have as much of the business uh aspect tied in there no i yeah she doesn't work in the business like both of your situations but still regardless of that it's just the the structure and someone that's around and that's supportive and that you help each other and you're on the same page on everything like it's not easy to date or marry someone in our industry mm -hmm. very difficult um so, so i think you need someone like that there's other people too, like it is so important to have those good people close, right? Like for instance, um, Justin, if, if Tom comes to me and says, this is what we're doing and this is a business idea, it's, there's no like, maybe let me look at it. Yeah, for sure. It's like Tom said, so yes, right? So you need those people too. And I think the trouble that it sounds like, maybe even going back to the story that you had, maybe the guy that you're dealing with that had two private mortgages on a property maybe he made some bad decisions maybe he had advisors that weren't necessarily advising him along the way as well and telling him that this type of thing is a good idea and that's got to be tough for everybody that's thinking whose parents didn't tell them it was a bad idea to buy real estate when they did because they should wait for the market to come down everybody's parents ever said that and that's been bad advice does that make sense like you it, need it does and actually close to you and how do you identify who the right people are how do you identify if tom indeed is a good agent to use in downtown toronto or if he's just some young punk blowing a bunch of bs on youtube right like how do you how do you determine that well you I asked the right questions sorry Justin, <laughs> no you're fine brother i was just saying there's a constant concentric circle idea that I always kind of look back to of, you know, your smallest concentric circle would be yourself. And then it would be probably your partner, right? Your wife or your spouse. Um, and there's a level of trust that's established there over time where what Tom was saying, like, I have that with Shane and where we're on the same team. And I think where relationships fall apart quite often is they don't feel like they're on the same team. They're living separate lives versus having at least trust that whatever the person's doing, they're doing it for the team. Then I think you go one level out of that and I'd say you have your board of advisors. And this can be very broad, right? It could be like your relationships, I would say board of advisors, right? Like if Tom's doing something, it's kind of like the level of trust that you have with somebody that's in your inner circle where you know that he's doing it for the right reasons. Even if you maybe don't understand why he's making that decision, you know enough of about him that awesome. Like we are, we're heading towards the same direction. That again comes from communication then I would say people, when they're looking for their advisors and they're trying to vet them, I always find I would look at 
that person's board of advisors and talk to them and really get an understanding of like, what is your vision? What are your core principles? And as long as those two things are in alignment, usually you can find commonality and build that bridge, but it takes time. I don't think anybody should just go to a financial advisor or real estate agent because all of their buddies use them. I think they can build a relationship with them and be very honest about the fact that you don't know this person yet. Like Mm -hmm. it's going to take time and people that you think have your best interests at heart could stab you in the back tomorrow. And don't let that get your ego all feeling one way or another. It's not a you thing. It's a them thing. You're the one that has to do the work to actually identify who these people are and also invest in the relationship. You have to give to get in relationships. Good example. Well, before we launched the show, I tried to put you in touch with two people that are in my inner circle. These are guys that I've spent 10 years building a relationship with. A lot of people just want photo ops with them, but I trust Tom enough because of how he's interacted with me for probably going on three or four years now. that I know he's not, I, I call it a vampire where he just wants something from me. He's given to me. I've given to him. I don't need him. He doesn't need me, but we're better together than we are apart. I think that's where I'll land my plane on this topic. So when I look for partnerships, I look for people where I don't need anything from them. They don't need anything from me. They would probably be wildly successful on their own, but one plus one equals three. And if you can align yourself with those people, core principles, good work ethic and drive and integrity above all, I think you'll be in great shape. Steve, what circle am I in? If you're, if you got your inner circle, what, how many rings out have I made the circle for you? I mean, you're still within the sleep together circle, right? <laughs> so we've got like, <laughs> I have my circle. So there's there's marriage, and that's that's tight. And then Am I just people, outside that one. People I've shared a bed with, which okay. is slightly outside of my marriage, which sounds right. very strange. And uh, I mean, it's a tight. There's probably and then hotel tight. rooms are expensive in Toronto. Sometimes I you mean, gotta make it work. There, there's probably, I mean, I'm tighter with one of my brothers than the rest. And then there's Tom and then there's uh, John Bai out of Seattle. And that's probably, those are my guys, man. That's my, that's my tight crew. And then, and then you start getting into things like coaches and, right. and you know, sure. your daily people, but you do have, um, you know, there's, there's not many people you'd help dispose of a body for. There's a couple. One thing that I've been <laughs> pondering. Oh, you're on that list. It's gonna be. It's gonna be weird getting the. I'm body not on disposing the of nothing for you. So. No. Um, um, well, <laughs> I know a that, guy. Yeah. Okay. One thing I've been thinking about <laughs> is, and and I I like the fact that some people really enjoy this show. I also like the fact that not everyone agrees with everything that we say, and if they did, that would probably be more of an issue, right? And I I think about this a lot. Where like I have my core group of friends, and all of them are doing. Um, in the general sense of how you look at someone succeeding in life, like they're doing pretty well. Most of my friends that I associate with on a daily to weekly basis, I'd say nine out of 10 of them own their house, um, or have good jobs, have things figured out. Um, And I'm not having, if it was the opposite, I'm having conversations with people that are maybe struggling through life a little bit more and things like that. My opinion on the outlook of Canadian real estate and everything would be a lot different than it is on the other side of it. And, and I know with both of you, it's the same thing, right? Like you're t- even in our, in our world of, you know, paying for mentors and coaches and things you get put in these mastermind groups and like, you're sitting with the people that take this seriously. And it's been the best thing I ever did because it's taken to me a, to a level I never really thought was possible. And it's not that you don't want to then go, you know, hang out with the person from high school whose life's really not together anymore and check in on them and see how things are going. But I'm just not having those conversations. And maybe this podcast, Steve, and let me know if I'm going way off tangent here. Maybe we're missing a little bit of that where all the people we've had on this show are relatively successful. That's why we invite them on because we appreciate what they do and we just like them as humans. We haven't heard as much of the of the struggling side other than the conversations we've had with people where we share the little pieces without putting out personal information. Is there something to that? Funny that you bring that up because the biggest um, stepping stone I ever took in my entire life was a conceited, is that the right term? A, A specific effort in order to remove people from my life of which we're not adding value. Right. Mm-hmm. And for me at that time was a changing of what I would call my friend group. And I did it consciously and on purpose. And I'm still in touch occasionally with some of them. And they are in the exact same place that they were 20 years ago when I did it. 
17 years ago when I did it. And now I'm talking to uh, people that, I mean, for instance, let's give you a, a, a for instance, this show, the amount of people I've talked to on this show that are so much more elevated in any sector of life, let alone real the real estate business. Like I shouldn't be talking to these people. I got a fun one for you guys. So to that point, I, I was a drug addict, almost killed myself three times. Um, I should have been dead with the amount of things I was doing in the past, right? And I was around those exact same people that you're describing. And it took a conscious effort for me to realize like my faith is really what saved me, but it was a big man upstairs knocking on the door three times. Like I not only had to do what you did, I had to do it three times. I had to leave a city to get perspective and then come back and make a conscious decision to change where I was at. And here's where I, I live my rule by now is happy to collaborate with anybody. I'm happy to sit and talk to somebody on the street that's in the position that I was in because I might be the only person I could talk to them because I understand what that's like. And I got out of it. Like there is life on the other side of that. Same thing that you're saying, Tom, I love the empathy that you share for people watching it and being like, well, easy for you guys to say, They're like, we were you, like I was you. I was probably worse off than you were. Didn't even know where my next meal was coming from at one point, but it takes you have to activate that. You have to find the people and you have to just make a decision that I'm drawing the line here. And from this day forward, I am no longer this person. You can't let people put labels on you. And you find that with people that from your past have nothing to talk about, but gossip about other people, yeah. the great times you had in the past or negativity. If you take those three things away, they have no substance. Those are not your people. And if you're one of those people and you're like, all I do is gossip, talk neg negatively about people and then reminisce about the past and say, oh yeah, remember when you drank, you get so angry. I'm like, I quit drinking over a decade ago. I'm not that person anymore. Then they'll start to realize that by breaking those patterns, they can find opportunity in their own life and they, they can find a path forward to grow. And it's typically that they just haven't grown, Steve, to your point. And it's funny that the, like when I am meeting, there's lots of people that complain about affordability and getting into the market. But when I'm meeting with actual clients, first time buyers that are thinking about getting into the market, they're having that same conversation with me. They're looking and going, my friends are not thinking about this. Yeah, They're thinking about doing other things. They're not, it's not possible. And then I was actually just met with a, it was probably somebody that's listening to this. And I, I met and I just, we were having a conversation. He was just saying like, nobody's, nobody my age is doing this. And I said, I, I, it wasn't when I bought either. I bought at 25 and then you throw your first party and you invite everybody over and people are like, oh, that's a pretty cool place. How much is rent here? And you get to be like at 25 years old, be like rent. No, no, no. I bought it. Like, sure. I have a mortgage, but Hey, I bought it. And then the cool part about that was then your friends, you're like, it's the first, you can see the seed being planted in those friends of yours of like, oh, wait, if you bought it, maybe I can buy it because you're Steve's a knob, right? Like <laughs> he's a nobody. I'm smarter than him. I make more money than him. Maybe I can make this happen. Knob, no, such a funny you, term. I, for sure, if I'm not a knob now, I was then. So let's just, but like you can plant that seed through your friends. And then what I had to do, I didn't have a uh, drug addiction. I didn't have any of that stuff. Those were not even my friends. I just knew that they weren't um, going to the next level. They weren't hmm. leveling up in life. And I thought to myself, and particularly uh, one of my best buds in the whole world, John, who's been on this show, um, he was the guy that like was like, hey, man, there's next levels and we got to go. And I was like, all right, let's do it. And so actively removing those, what's the term? Can't fly with the eagles if you're hanging with the turkeys. Hanging with the whatever. turkeys, yeah. That's, a great, that's what it is. That's what it is. And it's that's where people, this is nothing to do with real estate, Tom Story. This is this is, might where, be one of our best episodes ever. I don't care if there's nothing to do with real estate. I think this, this is, is a where, conversation people need to hear. But this is how people get into that next level because if you're sitting there having that talk about woe is me, I can't afford my rent, I deserve this, or or whatever in BC it's tax the rich because I'm not one of them. Um, like you, you can't even know that the next level is possible if you're sitting there in that victim mentality. 
Justin, you don't have to share too much about your past, but I'm, I'm just curious for, I know there is, there is, I, for sure there is one person listening to this that is going through some type of scenario that you have been through. And I didn't know that about you until you just said that. Um, any, was there a moment that you just woke up one day and said, this is it, I'm done with this, I'm moving forward? There's, is there any advice you could give? Because I know that it would be helpful for one person listening to this. I'm like, how do you get out of that sure. where you feel like you're trapped? Yeah, so there's two moments actually. One was actually my sister. I remember she pulled up in front of the apartment that I lived at, really nice nice apartment. I was the life of the party. I ran all the bars. You would have never known. Like I was a functioning addict, high level. I worked jobs. I had a really good position. It was, you know, but I, I was just completely lost. And I was trying to prove to the world how awesome I was, realizing the world could care less. It didn't matter what you achieve or how much money you make or what you buy. And going back to the beginning of our conversation, it was when I realized that. I really had to take a real look at myself and where I wanted to go in life. And I had left Montreal, which is where I was born and raised initially because I was a really, around really bad people. I had really good connections, but I was like, saw some people go to jail and saw some people doing things. I'm like, I always felt like I didn't belong with the wolves. I could run with them. I understood how they operated, but I was never one of them. I didn't want to take advantage of people. So I left. But then I came to a city where I got thrown into the hospitality culture, fell down that path. And anyways, long story short, it was that day with my sister and I took an eight month sabbatical and I actually ended up in the hospital for seven days because apparently you're not supposed to quit drugs and just not do them right away um, for seven days. And that reset was when I actually went back to my faith that I had had a kid and you believe in what you want to believe in. This is just right. my story. And I actually asked God to like prove to me that he was real and he did in a very, very apparent way. Um, and then I just promised him if he got me through that, that I would sir, do more searching, right? And I came back to London and it wasn't perfect. It took time, right? Like first I quit doing drugs and then I realized I was a functioning alcoholic. I would drink like crazy and I'd be the life of the party. And the people in my life that incentivized that, I mean, I was a clown to them, right? They did it because I was a great person to have around. But the stories after, I was like, do I want to be known as that person? And the answer right. was clearly no. I was ambitious and my wife was the one who kept unlocking the next levels of me. To your point, Steve, you want to find people that will build bridges and show you what's possible. You have to do the work. The reason I have the wall of champions behind me, if you're watching my terrible video stream on YouTube, I apologize. Um, next time I'll have my DSLR. It's pretty good. Game. It's pretty good right now. It's pretty good. All right. My, uh, my cam link dropped off. So I, I'm glad you guys didn't kick me off the show, but the wall of champions is photos of people that I have done something of significance and could care less what the world said about them from Seth Godin to Gordon Ryan, Laird Hamilton, Ryan Serhan, people, some people that I'm friends with, some people that are dead and gone, but every single one of them just are laser focused on doing something of significance in their life. They were mocked. They were told they were stupid. They would never do it until they weren't. And I think every single person watching this, if you were at the bottom of the bear like I was, I promise you somebody has achieved it that's in a worse position than you. I know it's hard. I know it's not easy. Maybe you just need people to help you. Those people are out there, but you have to get out there and search for them. And when they give you something to do, do it. My relationship with Ryan is because I would meet him once a year early on when he had no idea who I was. He'd give me an activation. I brought him a complex problem. A year later, I'd show up in his office, pick, okay, did that. Now I have 153 new, new homes to sell. I have no idea what I'm doing. Help me. Another solution. A year later, he's like, oh crap, he's actually doing it. And then after seven years, now I have his personal cell. He's a friend of mine. And it, it is a real friendship slash mentorship, but I'm sure he's met thousands of people that he's given advice to that just thought he's the guy from TV and wanted the photo op and thought that was going to make them rich when in reality, it was just getting around practitioners and doing the damn work. So sorry for my rant, but no, no. I mean, what I, what I take out of that more, I mean, just as much as anything else you said is that you removed yourself from the situation you were in to yep. better your life. Right. And, and you went back, no, you didn't, you didn't go back to the life you had, but you went back to the physical location that you were previously in and then move forward with new people surrounding you. Um, so I think, you know, if we look at this and, and taking this back to real estate, like there are people listening to this that uh, want to get into the market. Uh, there was actually, hold on, let me read this. 
Something about the fact that despite the challenge of the market, 73% of Canadians still view home ownership as the best investment, uh, reflecting the strong belief. Like, so people believe in real estate, like generally across the board, we know that. So there's people that want to get in and, and we can talk your ear off for hours on down payment, financial responsibility, mm -hmm. understanding how this all works. Maybe even before we get that, we got to get everything else in order. We got to get our, our, our mindset shift changed before any yeah. of the other stuff's even going to mean anything. Yeah. 100%. So, so maybe we have to start there. And, and the way that I'd like to wrap this up is interesting. There was this study that came out that said a third of Canadians were exploring non traditional ways to enter the housing market. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to run these three ways by you guys and see what you think. Um, so it really just came down to the first one, which is. I'd actually argue pretty traditional is renting out a secondary unit. So having a house and adding a secondary unit to it, which Steve, you do with your basement. Lots of people in Toronto are building laneway suites. I don't really know if that's non-traditional. I think that's becoming more, more normal. Yeah. So that's number one. Co-owning with family members other than a spouse is number two. And then do number you do, you do many of those, Tom? Have you done like I've done a couple but with family members other than a spouse? I've yeah. never no no i've never owned property well that's not true i mean the first condo i bought my dad had to co-sign because i was an independent contractor one year into my career but so you haven't done like in-laws in the basement you haven't done like uh i had one where it was a married couple and then one of their brothers bought with them in the basement like you you don't do like, i've i've never personally done that but not saying that that's not an interesting idea that could that could unlock op opportunities for people. When my brother bought his first place, I moved in as a tenant and then he yeah. rented out the other bedroom as well. So it was a three bedroom, it was a great party house, but um, it really, like that off offset right. his expenses, right? And I'm not sure, I guess, I mean, at that time that was a three bedroom and he could do it, but there's not a lot of people that have roommates these days either that I find. But that, that again, I think comes back to, a, I feel like I'm moving forward in life. If I got a roommate now, I'd feel like I'm moving backwards. Yeah. I think a lot of people do have that mindset, which I, it's is somewhat fair. And then the third one is fractional ownership. Have you guys thought about this? Like I know Steve, you like the uh, the mix, and and I know there's a lot of companies that you can buy like percentages, small percentages of these big projects. Ju Justin, is that something you've seen in your market? Are people getting into that that are not maybe maybe they already own their house and they're just looking for another investment opportunity, but they don't want to buy, they don't want to deal with being a landlord. Are you seeing, is this working okay for people or people investing in REITs or whatever? Is that happening? Yeah, actually I'm hosting a mastermind tomorrow. Um, and there's a bunch of people that own REITs and it's invite only. They're very specific people that I've watched over the years that have integrity. And basically they're people that know how to invest in real estate and different things, different niches, some recreational, some apartment buildings, some land development. And they're really good at analytics, right? Like they typically know how to run a project. And there's people that are interested in that asset class, but don't want to spend 10,000 hours to learn it. So they'll partner with a REIT or a small group of investors. Um, we have a storage group coming to our market and we're going to be looking for a $12 million capital raise in April. But again, this isn't something that I'm just pumping out to the public. Like it is literally one-on-one. -on -one. Is this something that you're interested in? These are the people, there's a lot of vetting that goes on in that to they put a massive asterisk. I think a lot of people got burned with YouTube investor agents that had no idea what they were doing um, 2020 to 2022. And then for the other side of the coin, I have seen a lot of what Steve said, like people hacking it, right? Like living with a couple people, getting into a place where they're investing together. I had tons of clients and investors that are brothers that buy investment properties. They do the renos. I have one of my agents, Taylor and her brother, um, they buy stuff all, the, all over the place. He worked for a builder. He's a general contractor. She's good on the real estate side. I personally, the only person I invest with is my wife. It's been how we've always done it. Like we've had opportunities for business and I would have said yes, because I'm a crazy person, but she's the one that's like, you're the only person that I trust. Like, this is just how we're doing it. I think people got to find what's right for them. One idea I want to give the, the audience is if I was starting over and I was thinking about it as you were saying this, and I wanted to get into the real estate investment game. I'd go on Instagram. I'd find a really good local real estate investor. I'd start doing my due diligence, ask about his core people, find out if he's got integrity. And then I would offer to literally live in one of his units as a superintendent for a discounted rent just to learn the business. And I think if you can get around somebody that's doing the thing that you want to do, offer the one thing you have, which is time, trade that to get the skill. And then eventually you'll start getting some money. That's a really good way because then he trusts you probably bring you into some deals and all of a sudden now you're making money and you're developing skill at a rapid pace right 
I mean, that even goes back to the advice that we give people in our own industry is like, uh, go grab the top agent at your office, grab their pant leg and hold on tight and yeah, follow yeah, them right. around and see what they're doing and do it for free for the first little bit and just learn, go to appointments with them, see what's going on. This this translates to any industry, right? This is just right. mentorship. Um, but finding people that, that are willing to do it for you, um, which is tough sometimes when when you get to that level, the, the level of the people you're trying to get help from, they don't have a lot of time. So make their life easier by giving them something that they, they can't do on their own. And I, I think there's an obvious path there towards moving forward in your career. Um, just, snuggle up, just snuggle up next to Steve and you'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, that was fun, man. Thank you so I much mean, for coming I am, on. I'm cozy. I got yeah. a little padding. Steve. We're good. <laughs> Uh, Justin, for the people uh, that have listened this far in, uh, and I, I really hope you guys have enjoyed today's conversation, a little bit maybe different than what we normally do, but I think this is personally one of my favorite ones we've ever done. Uh, we're, see, we're finally getting the hang of this, episode 99, eh? Finally you think so? figuring things out over here. Well, we still got lots to learn, but we're trying. 99, uh, this may go down as the great one, so that's good. I appreciate it. This is the type of conversation <laughs> I like to have. It just happens to be less about real estate, or like you said, Tom, maybe it's actually the building blocks of I getting it, into real estate in the first place even before you think about real estate mm -hmm. um so that's awesome and i don't know do we want to make an announcement for episode 100 because this could be the one that breaks us into the mainstream no i don't think we say anything we've already jinxed, our, jinxed ourselves before with, an, with we're not saying anything um i'm personally a big fan of episode 99 right now justin for the people that are listening watching that have made it this long, uh, for them to reach out to you and your team, because you guys do fantastic work, what's the best place for them to go? I would just say come to my Instagram. I run it myself. Um, that's where you'll find most of my links. I'm on YouTube and all the audio platforms as well. And bit of a crazy person, but yeah, happy to make new friends. And I appreciate you guys for what you do on the show. It's I don't watch much TV on Sundays. I, I call it screen free Sundays, but your show has been great. And I always try to make an effort. So obviously anybody listening or watching, I definitely recommend they leave a review on this show. Thank you so much. You did my job for me. I didn't even have to ask. Them. That's amazing. Free and yeah, available on audio apps for screen free people on Sundays. I awesome. can I just say something? I so I've always been a, a podcast watcher. I like going on YouTube and watching podcasts. But the other day I had to my, my drive to Leamington. I had a four hour drive. There's something about listening with just audio that might actually be more powerful. I don't know if that I just went through this myself. Oh, There's the, something the about way. it. It's the only way I do podcasts. But most of our views are YouTube based. Like it's all it's, of our views are YouTube based. Tom. Not all. We have a good audio download. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, saying views. You use the wrong word. Tom. Whatever. <laughs> most of our listens. Whatever. No, you get what actually, I'm trying to say. It is strange. There's something the, weird about audio only. It hit yeah, me yeah. different when I was listening than uh, watching someone do, it, which is odd. Yeah. yeah, it's because you get to just listen to my sexy voice and not oh God, have to oh see my ugly face. That's the way it works. Yeah, that actually might add up. All right, everybody, thank you for watching. Hey, thank you for listening, if you're listening as well. We appreciate you being here. Uh, Justin, this was awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Steve, give, give us our final thought. Wrap it up. No, Wrap it great. up. Great. Love it. I love it. Okay. I appreciate, right. uh, appreciate this conversation. It's a little off script, but I like that's it. why I like it. Thank you, everyone, for watching listening, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.